Chapter 51 of The Wild Huntress. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Annabel Smith. The Wild Huntress by Thomas Main Reed. Chapter 51 The Orphan Butte. The landscape over which we were looking was one that has long been celebrated in the legends of trapper and sibilero and certainly no lovelier is to be met with in the midland regions of america though new to my eyes i recognized it from the descriptions i had read and heard of it there was an idiosyncrasy in its features especially in that lone mound rising conspicuously in its midst which at once proclaimed it the valley of the huerfano there stood the orphan butte there was no mistaking its identity. This valley, or more properly, valet, a word of very different signification, is in reality a level plain, flanked on each side by a continuous line of bluffs or benches, themselves forming the abutments of a still higher plain, which constitutes the general level of the country. The width between the bluffs is five or six miles, but at the distance of some ten miles from our point of view, the cliffs converge, apparently closing in the valley in that direction. This, however, is only apparent. Above the butte is another deep canyon, through which the river has cleft its way. The intervening space is a picture fair to behold. The surface, level as a billiard table, is covered with gramma grass, of a bright, almost emerald verdure. The uniformity of this color is relieved by cottonwood copses, whose foliage is but one shade darker. Commingling with these, and again slightly darkening the hue of the frondage, are other trees, with a variety of shrubs or climbing plants, as clematis, wild roses, and willows. Here and there, a noble poplar stands apart, as if disdaining to associate with the more lowly growth of the groves. These topes are of varied forms, some rounded, some oval, and others of more irregular shape. Many of them appear as if planted by the hands of the landscape gardener, while the huerfano, winding through their midst, could not have been more gracefully guided had it been specially designed for an ornamental water. The butte itself, rising in the center of the plain and towering nearly two hundred feet above the general level, has all the semblance of an artificial work, not of human hands, but a cairn constructed by giants. Just such does it appear, a vast pyramidal cone, composed of huge prismatic blocks of granite, black almost as a coal, the dark color being occasioned by an iron admixture in the rock. For two-thirds of its slope, a thick growth of cedar covers the mound with a skirting of darkest green. Above this appear the dark naked prisms, piled one upon the other in a sort of irregular crystallization, and ending in a summit slightly truncated. Detached boulders lie around its base, huge pieces that, having yielded to the disintegrating influences of rain and wind, had lost their balance and rolled down the declivity of its sides. No other similar elevation is near, the distant bluffs alone equaling it in height. But there the resemblance ends, for the latter are a formation of stratified sandstone, while the rocks composing the butte are purely granitic. Even in a geological point of view is the orphan butte isolated from all the world. In a double sense does it merit its distinctive title. Singular is the picture formed by the Sloan Mound, and the park-like scene that surrounds it, a picture rare as fair. Its very framing is peculiar. The bench of light reddish sandstone sharply outlined on each edge, the bright green of the sward along its base, and the dark belt of cedars cresting its summit form, as it were, a double moulding to the frame. Over this can be distinguished the severe outline of the great cordilleras. Above them, again, the twin cones of the Watuye, and grandly towering over all, the sharp, sky-piercing summit of Pike's Peak. All these forms gleaming in the full light of a noonday sun, with a heaven above them of deep ethereal blue.
present a picture that for grandeur and sublimity is not surpassed upon the earth a long while could we have gazed upon it but an object that came at once under our eyes turned our thoughts into a far different channel away up the valley at its furthest end appeared a small white spot little bigger to our view than the disk of an archer's target it was of an irregular roundish form and on both sides of it were other shapes smaller and of darker hue we had no difficulty in making out what these appearances were the white object was the tilt of a wagon the dark forms around it were those of men mounted and afoot it must have been the last wagon of the train since no other could be seen and as it appeared at the very end of the valley in the angle formed by the convergence of the cliffs we concluded that there the cannon opened into which the rest had entered whether the wagon scene was moving onward we did not stay to determine the caravan was in sight and this acting upon us like an electric influence impelled us to hasten forward calling to our companions to advance we remounted our horses rode out of the gorge and kept on up the valley we no longer observed the slightest caution the caravan was before our eyes and there could be no doubt that in a couple of hours we should be able to come up with it as to danger we no longer thought of such a thing indians would scarcely be so daring as to assail us within sight of the train had it been night we might have reasoned differently but under the broad light of day we could not imagine there was the slightest prospect of danger we resolved therefore to ride direct for the wagons without making halt yes one halt was to be made i had promised the sedivant soldiers to make civilians of them before bringing them face to face with the escort and this was to be accomplished by means of some spare wardrobe which wingrove and i chanced to have among our packs the place fixed upon as the scene of the metamorphosis was the butte which lay directly on our route as we rode forward i was gratified at perceiving that the wagon still remained in sight if it was moving on it had not yet reached the head of the valley perhaps it had stopped to receive some repairs so much the better we should the sooner overtake it on arriving at the butte the white canvas was still visible though from our low position on the plain only the top of the tilt could be seen while wingrove was unpacking our spare garments i dismounted and climbed to the summit of the mound in order to obtain a better view i had no difficulty in getting up for strange to say a trail runs over the orphan butte from southeast to northwest regularly aligned with pike's peak in the latter direction and with spanish peaks in the former but this alignment was not the circumstance that struck me as singular a far more curious phenomenon came under my observation the path leading to the summit was entirely clear of the granite blocks that everywhere else covered the declivities of the mound between these it passed like a narrow lane the huge prisms rising on each side of it piled up in a regular trap-like formation as if placed there by the hand of man the latter hypothesis was out of the question many of the blocks were a dozen feet in diameter and tons in weight titans alone could have lifted them the summit itself was a table of some twenty by forty feet in superficial extent and seamed by several fissures only by following the path could the summit be reached without great difficulty the loose boulders rested upon one another in such a fashion that even the most expert climber would have found difficulty in scaling them and the stunted spreading cedars that grew between their clefts combined in forming a chevaux de frise almost impenetrable i was not permitted to dwell long on the contemplation of this geological phenomenon on reaching the summit and directing my telescope up the valley i obtained a tableau in its field of vision that almost caused me to drop the glass out of my fingers the whole wagon was in view down to its wheel tracks and the dark forms were still around it some were afoot others on horseback while a few appeared to be lying flat along the sward whoever these last may have been i saw at the first glance what the others were the bronzed skins of naked bodies the masses of long sweeping hair the plumed crests and floating drapery were perfectly apparent in the glass and all indicating a truth of terrible significance that the forms thus seen were those of savage men yes 
both they on horseback and afoot were Indians beyond a doubt, and those horizontally extended, they were white men, the owners of the wagons? This truth flashed on me as I beheld a fearful object, a body lying head towards me with its crown of mottled red and white, gleaming significantly through the glass. I had no doubt as to the nature of the object. It was a scalpless skull. End of chapter 51 Chapter 52 of The Wild Huntress This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Annabelle Smith The Wild Huntress by Thomas Main Reed Chapter 52 Raising a Rampart I kept the telescope to my eye not half so long as I have taken in telling of it. Quick as I saw that the men stirring around the wagon were Indians, I thought only of screening my person from their sight. To effect this, I dropped down from the summit of the rock, on the opposite side from that facing toward the savages. Showing only the top of my head, and with the glass once more leveled up the valley, I continued the observation. I now became assured that the victim of the ensanguined skull was a white man, that the other prostrate forms were also the bodies of white men, all dead, all, no doubt, mutilated in a similar manner? The tableau told its own tale. The presence of the wagon halted, and, without horses, one or two dead ones lying under the tongue, the ruck of Indians clustering around it, the bodies stretched along the earth, other objects, boxes and bales, strewed over the sward, all were significant of recent strife. The scene explained what we had heard while coming up the canyon. The fusillade had been no fancy, but a fearful reality. Fearful, too, in its effects, as I was now satisfied by the testimony of my telescope. The caravan had been attacked, or, more likely, only a single wagon that had been straggling in the rear. The firing may have proceeded from the escort, or the armed emigrants. Indians may have fallen. Indeed, there were some prostrate forms apart, with groups gathered around them, and those I conjectured to be the corpses of red men, but it was evident the Indians had proved victorious, since they were still upon the field, still holding the place and the plunder. Where were the other wagons of the train? There were fifty of them. Only one was in sight. It was scarcely possible that the whole caravan had been captured. If so, they must have succumbed within the pass? A fearful massacre must have been made? This was improbable, the more so that the Indians around the wagon appeared to number near two hundred men. They must have constituted the full band, for it is rare that a war party is larger. Those seen appeared to be all warriors, naked from the breach, clout upward, their skins glaring with pigments. Neither woman nor child could I see among them. Had the other wagons been captured, there would not have been so many of the captors clustered around this particular one. In all likelihood, the vehicle had been coming up behind the others. The animals drawing it had been shot down in the skirmish, and it had fallen into the hands of the successful assailants. These conjectures occupied me only a moment. Mingled with them was one of still more special import. To whom had belonged the abandoned wagon? With fearful apprehension, I covered the ground with my glass, straining my sight as I gazed through it. I swept the whole surface of the surrounding plain. I looked under the wagon, on both sides of it, and beyond. I sought amidst the masses of dusky forms, I examined the groups and stragglers, even the corpses that strewed the plain. Thank heaven, they were all black, or brown, or red. All appeared to be men, both the living and the dead. Thank heaven. The ejaculation ended my survey of the scene. It had scarcely occupied ten seconds of time. It was interrupted by a sudden movement on the part of the savages. Those on horseback were seen separating from the rest, and, the instant after, appeared coming on in the direction of the butte. The movement was easily accounted for. My imprudence had betrayed our presence. I had been seen while standing on the summit of the mound. I felt regret for my own rashness, but there was no time to indulge in the feeling, and I stifled it. The moment called for action— 
demanding all the firmness of nerve and coolness of head, which, fortunately, I had acquired by the experience of similar arises. Instead of shouting to my comrades, as yet unconscious of the approaching danger, I remained upon the summit without uttering a word or showing a sign that might alarm them. My object in so acting was to avoid the confusion consequent upon a sudden panic, and keep my mind free to think over some plan of escape. The Indians were still five miles off. It would be some minutes at least before they could attack us. Two or three of these could be spared for reflection. After that, it would be time to call in the counsel of my companions. I am here describing in detail, and with the tranquility of closet retrospect, thoughts that follow one another with the rapidity of lightning flashes. To say that I reflected coolly would not be true. I was at that moment too much under the influence of fear for tranquil reflection. I perceived at once that the situation was more than dangerous. It was desperate. Flight was my first thought, or rather, my first instinct. For, on reflection, it failed. The idea was to fling off the packs, mount the two pedestrians upon the mules, and gallop back for the canyon. The conception was good enough, if it had been carried out, but of this there was no hope. The defile was too distant to be reached in time. The two who might ride the mules could never make it, they must fall by the way. Even if all four of us should succeed in getting back to the canyon, what then? Was it likely we should ever emerge from it? We might for a time defend ourselves within its narrow gorge, but to pass clear through and escape at the other end would be impossible. A party of our pursuers would be certain to take over the ridge and head us below, to anticipate them in their arrival there, and reach the woods beyond, would be utterly out of our power. The trail through the canyon was full of obstacles, as we had already discovered, and these would delay us. Without a prospect of reaching the forest below, it would be of no use attempting flight. In the valley around us there was no timber to track, nothing that deserved the name of a wood, only copses and groves, the largest of which would not have sheltered us for an hour. I had a reflection. Happy am I now, and proud, that I had the virtue to stifle it. For myself, escape by flight might not have been so problematical. A steed stood near that could have carried me beyond all danger. It only needed to fling myself into the saddle and ply the spur. Even without that impulsion, my Arab would, and could, have carried me clear of the pursuit. Death was preferable to the thought. I could only indulge it as a last resort, after all else had failed and fallen. Three men were my companions, true and tried. To all of them I owed some service, to one little less than my life, for the bullet of the eccentric ranger had once saved me from an enemy. It was I who had brought on the impending attack. It was but just I should share its danger, and the thought of shunning it vanished on the instant of its conception. Escape by flight appeared hopeless. On the shortest survey of the circumstances, I perceived that our only chance lay in defending ourselves. The chance was not much worth— but there was no alternative. We must stand and fight, or fall without resisting. From such a foe as that coming down upon us, we need to expect no grace, not a modicum of mercy. Where was our defense to be made? On the summit of the butte? There was no better place in sight, no other that could be reached, offering so many advantages. Had we chosen it for a point of defense, it could not have promised better for the purpose." As already stated, the cone was slightly truncated, its top ending in a mesa. The table was large enough to hold four of us. By crouching low, or lying flat upon it, we should be screened from the arrows of the Indians, or such other weapons as they might use. On the other hand, the muzzles of four guns pointed at them would deter them from approaching the base of the butte. Scarcely a minute was I in maturing a plan, and I lost less time in communicating it to my companions. Returning to them, as fast as I could make the descent, I announced the approach of the Indians. The announcement produced a surprise sufficiently unpleasant, but no confusion. The old soldiers had been too often under fire to be frightened out of their senses at the approach of an enemy, and the young hunter was not one to give way to panic. All three remained cool and collected as they listened to my hurried detail of the plan I had sketched out for our defense. There was no difficulty in inducing them to adopt it. 
all agreed to it eagerly and at once. In short, all saw that there was no alternative. Up the mound again, this time followed by my three comrades, each of us heavily laden. In addition to our guns and ammunition, we carried our saddles and mule packs, our blankets and buffalo robes. It was not their intrinsic value that tempted us to take this trouble with our impedimenta. Our object was to make with them a rampart upon the rock. We had just time for a second trip, and, flinging our first loads up to the table, we rushed back down the declivity. Each seized upon such objects as offered themselves, phalluses, the soldiers' knapsacks, joints of the antelope lately killed, and the noted meal bag, all articles likely to avail us in building our bulwark. The animals must be abandoned, both horses and mules. Could we take them up to the summit? Yes, the thing could be accomplished, but to what purpose? It would be worse than useless, since it would only render them an aim for the arrows of the enemy, and ensure their being shot down at once. To leave them below appeared the better plan. A tree stood near the base of the mound. To its branches, their bridles had already been looped. There they would be within easy range of our rifles. We could shelter them so long as there was light. To protect them might appear of little advantage, since in the darkness they could be easily taken from us. But in leaving them thus, we were not without some design. We, too, might build a hope on the darkness. If we could succeed in sustaining the attack until nightfall, flight might then avail us. In truth, that seemed the only chance we should have of ultimately escaping from our perilous situation. We resolved, therefore, to look well to the safety of the animals, though forced to forsake them for a time, we might still keep the enemy off, and again recover them. The contingency was not clear, and we were too much hurried to dwell long upon it. It only flitted before our minds like a gleam of light, though, the misty future. I had just time to bid farewell to my Arab, to run my fingers along his smooth arching neck, to press my lips to his velvet muzzle. Brave steed, tried and trusty friend, I could have wept at the parting. He made answer to my caresses, he answered them with a low whimpering neigh. He knew there was something amiss, that there was danger, our hurried movements had apprised him of it. But the moment after, his altered attitude, his flashing eyes, and the loud snorting from his spread nostrils told that he perfectly comprehended the danger. He heard the distant trampling of hoofs. He knew that an enemy was approaching. I heard the sounds myself, and rushed back up the butte. My companions were already upon the summit, busied in building the rampart around the rock. I joined them and aided them in the work. Our paraphernalia proved excellent for the purpose, light enough to be easily handled, and sufficiently firm to resist either bullets or arrows. Before the Indians had come within hailing distance, the parapet was completed, and, crouching behind it, we awaited their approach. End of chapter 52 Chapter 53 of The Wild Huntress This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Brandon. The Wild Huntress by Thomas Maine Reed. Chapter 53. The War Cry. How? Ooh, Ogaloo! Uttered loudly from a hundred throats, comes pealing down the valley its fiendish notes coupled with the demon-like forms that give utterance to them are well calculated to quail the stoutest heart ours are not without fear though we know that the danger is not immediate there is a significance in the tones of that wild slogan they express more than the usual hostility of red to white they breathe a spirit of vengeance the gestures of menace the brandished spears and bended bows the war clubs waving in the air are all signs of the excited anger of the indians blood has been spilled perhaps the blood of some of their chosen warriors and ours will be sought to a certainty we perceive no signs of the pacific intent no semblance that would lead us to hope for mercy 
the foe is bent on our destruction he rushes forward to kill i have said that the danger was not immediate i did not conceive it so my conception was based upon experience i had met the prairie indians before in the south but north or south i knew that their tactics were the same it is a mistake to suppose that these savages rush recklessly upon death only when their enemy is far inferior to them in numbers or otherwise an undermatch will they advance boldly to the fight they will do this in an attack upon mexicans whose prowess they despise or sometimes in a conflict with their own kind when stimulated by warrior pride and the promptings of the tribal vendetta on other occasions they are sufficiently careful of their skins more especially in an encounter with the white trappers or even travellers who tenter the prairies from the east of all other weapons they dread the long rifle of the hunter it is only after stratagem has failed when do or die becomes a necessity that the horse indian can bring himself to charge forward upon the glistening barrel the mere hope of plunder will not tempt even the boldest of red-skinned robbers within the circle of a rifle's range they all know from experience the deadliness of its aim most probably plunder had been their motive for attacking the train but their victims could only have been some straggling unfortunates too confident in their security these had not succumbed without a struggle the death of all of them proved this since not a prisoner appeared to have been taken further evidence of it was seen upon the sward for as the crowd scattered i observed through the glass several corpses that were not those of white men the robbers though victorious had suffered severely hence the vengeful yells with which they were charging down upon us with all their menace both of signs and sounds i had no fear of their charging up to the mound not yet to its base there were fifty yards around it within range of our guns and the first who should venture within the circle would not be likely to go forth from it alive not a shot is to be fired till you're sure of hitting do not one of you pull trigger till you have sighted your man this was the order passed around on the skill of my comrades i could confide on sure shot with all the certainty which his sobriquet expressed i have seen enough of the young hunter to know how he handled his rifle about the irishman alone was there a doubt only of his coolness and his aim of his courage there was none in this the infantry was perhaps equal to any one of us the words of caution had scarcely parted from my lips when the enemy came galloping up their yelling grew louder as they advanced and its echoes ringing from the rocks appeared to double the number of their wild vociferations we could only hear one another by calling out at the top of our voices but we had little to say the time for talking had expired that of action had arrived on come the whooping savages horrid to behold their faces arms and bodies frightfully painted each after his own device and all as hideous as savage conception can suggest the visages of bears wolves and other fierce animals are depicted on their breasts and shields with the still more horrid emblems of the death's head the crossbones and the red hand even their horses are covered with similar devices stained upon their skins in ochre charcoal and vermilion the sight is too fearful to be fantastic on they come uttering the wild how ugaloo brandishing their various weapons and making their shields of parfletch rattle by repeated strokes against their clubs and spears on comes the angry avalanche 
they are within a hundred yards of the butte for a moment we are in doubt if they charge up the declivity we are lost men we may shoot down the foremost but they are twenty to one in a hand-to-hand -hand struggle we shall be overwhelmed killed or captured in less than sixty seconds of time hold your fire i cried seeing my comrades lie with their cheeks against their guns not yet only two at a time but not yet ha as i expected and just as i had expected the wild ruck came to a halt those in the lead drawing up their horses as suddenly as if they had arrived upon the edge of a precipice they had come to a stand just in the nick of time had they advanced but five paces further at least two of their number would have tumbled out of their saddles sure shot and i had each selected our man and agreed upon the signal to fire the others were ready to follow all four barrels resting over the rampart had caught the eyes of the indians a glance at the glistening tubes was sufficient true to their old tactics it was the sight of these that had halted them End of chapter fifty three recording by john brandon chapter fifty four of the wild huntress this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by john brandon the wild huntress by thomas main reed chapter fifty four the red hand the whooping and the screaming are for a while suspended those in the rear have ridden up and the straggling cavalcade becomes massed upon the plain at less than two hundred yards distance from the butte shouts are still heard and talking in an unknown tongue but not the dread war cry that has failed in its effect and is heard no longer now and then young warriors gallop towards the butte vaunt their valor brandish their weapons shoot off their arrows and threaten us by word and gesture all however keep well outside the perilous circumference covered by our guns we perceive that they too have guns both muskets and rifles in all a dozen or more we can tell that they are empty those who carry them are dismounting to load we may expect soon to receive their fire but from the clumsy manner in which they handle their pieces that need not terrify us any more than their arrows already sent and falling far short half a dozen horsemen are conspicuous they are chiefs as can be told by the eagle plumes sticking in their hair with other insignia on their breasts and bodies these have ridden to the front and are grouped together their horses standing head to head their speeches and gesticulations declare that they are holding council the movements of menace are no longer made we have time to examine our enemies they are so near that i need scarcely level the glass upon them though through it i can note every feature with minute distinctness they are not comanches their bodies are too big and their limbs too long for these ishmaelites of the southern plains neither are they of the hickorilla apache they are too noble looking to resemble these skulking jackals more like are they to the kiowas but no they are not kiowas i have met these indians and should know them their war cry did not resemble theirs theirs is the war cry of the comanche i should have known it at once cheyennes they may be since it is their special ground or might it be that tribe of still darker deadlier fame 
the hostile arapaho if they be arapahoes we need look for no mercy i sweep the glass over them seeking for signs by which i may identify our enemy i perceive one that is significant the leggings of the chiefs and principal warriors are fringed with scalps their shields are encircled by similar ornaments most of these appendages are of dark hue the locks long and black but not all are of this kind or color one shield is conspicuously different from the rest a red hand is painted upon its black disc it is the totem of him who carries it a thick fringe of hair is set around its rim the tufts are of different lengths and colors there are tresses of brown blonde and even red hair curled and wavy coarse hair and some soft and silky through the glass i see all this with a clearness that leaves no doubt as to the character of these varied chevelures they are the scalps of whites both of men and women and the red hand upon the shield a red hand ah i remember there is a noted chief of the name famed for his hostility to the trappers famed for a ferocity unequalled among his race a savage who is said to delight in torturing his captives especially if it be a pale-face who has had the misfortune to fall into his hands can it be that fiend the red hand of the arapahoes the appearance of the man confirms my suspicion a body tall angular and ill-shaped scarred with cicatrist wounds and bent with age a face seamed with the traces of evil passion eyes deep sunken in their sockets and sparkling like coals of fire an aspect more fiend-like than human all this agrees with the descriptions i have had of the red hand chief assuredly it is he our enemies then are the arapahoes their leader the dreaded red hand heaven have mercy on us these men will have none such was the ejaculation that escaped my lips on recognizing or believing that i recognized the foe that was before us the red hand is seen to direct he's evidently leader of the band all seem obedient to his orders all move with military promptness at his word or nod beyond doubt it is the red hand and his followers who for crimes and cold-blooded atrocities are noted as he a dreaded band long known to the traitors of santa fe to the Sibileros from the taos valley to the trappers of the arkansas and platte we are not the first party of white men besieged by these barbarous robbers and if it be our fate to fall we shall not be their first victims many a brave mountain man has already fallen a victim to their fiendish grasp scarcely a trapper who cannot tell of some comrade who has been rubbed out by red hand and his rapahoes the council of the chiefs continues for some time some ruse is being devised and debated among them with palpitating hearts we await the issue i have made known my suspicions as to who is our enemy and cautioned my comrades to be on their guard i have told them 
that if my conjecture prove right we need look for no mercy the talk is at an end red hand is about to address us riding two lengths in front of his followers the savage chief makes halt his shield is held conspicuously upward its convexity towards us not for any purpose of security but evidently that we may see its device and know the bearer red hand is conscious of the terror inspired by his name in his other hand he carries an object better calculated than the shield to beget fearful emotions poised at the point of his long spear and held high aloft are the scalps recently taken there are six of them in the bunch easily told by the different hues of the hair and all easily identified as those of white men they are the scalps of the slain teamsters and others who had vainly attempted to defend the captured wagon they are all fresh and gory hang limber along the shaft the blood is not yet dry upon them the wet surface glitters in the sun we view them with singular emotions mine perhaps more singular than any i endeavor to identify some of those ghastly trophies i am but too satisfied at failing End of chapter 54 Recording by John Brandon Chapter 55 of The Wild Huntress This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Brandon the wild huntress by thomas main reed chapter fifty five an ill-timed shot hablo castellano cries the savage chieftain in broken spanish i'm not surprised at being addressed in this language by a prairie indian many of them speak spanish or its north mexican patois they have opportunities of learning it from the new mexican traders but better from their captives see si, cavallero i speak spanish what wishes the warrior with the red hand upon his shield the pale face is a stranger in this country else he would not ask such a question what wishes the red hand ha <laughs> ha the scalps of the white men their scalps and lives that is the will of the arapaho chief the speech is delivered in a tone of exultation and accompanied by a scornful laugh the savage is proud of his barbarous and bloodthirsty character he glories in the terror of his name with such a monster it seems idle to bold parley in the end it will be only to fight and if defeated to die but the drowning man cannot restrain himself from catching even at a straw arapaho we are not your enemies why should you desire to take our lives we are peaceful travellers passing through your country and have no wish to quarrel with our red brothers red brothers ha 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 tongue of a serpent and heart of a hare the proud arapaho is not your brother he disclaims kindred with a pale face red hand has no brothers among the whites all are alike his enemies behold their scalps upon his shield ugh see the fresh trophies upon his spear count them there are six there will be ten before the sun goes down the scalps of the four squaws 
skulking on the mound will hang from the spears of the arapahoes i could not contradict the declaration that was too fearfully probable i made no reply dogs fiercely vociferated the savage come down and deliver up your arms and our scalps too i suppose muttered the yankee neo certainly not at your price i don't sell my notions so dirt cheap as that comes to wouldn't pay no how look a year old red gloves continued he in a louder voice and raising his head above the rampart this here o mine air valuable do e see it air a rare color and a putty color it'd look just the thing on that shield o' yourn but tain't there yet not by a long chalk and i calculate if ye want the skin o' my head ye'll have to trot up and take it ugh ejaculated the indian with an impatient gesture the yellow squaw is not worth the words of a chief his scalp is not for the shield of a warrior it will be given to the dogs of our tribe it will be thrown to the jackals of the prairie ain't particular about what ye do with it that is after ye got it don't ye wish ye may get it eh wog exclaimed the savage with another impatient gesticulation the red hand is tired talking one word more listen to it chief of the pale faces come down and deliver up your fire weapons the red hand will be merciful he will spare your lives if you resist he will torture you with fire the knives of his warriors will hew the living flesh from your bones you shall die a hundred deaths and the great spirit of the arapahoes will smile at the sacrifice and what if we do not resist your lives shall be spared the red hand declares it on the faith of a warrior faith of a warrior faith of a cutthroat he only wants to come round us captain and get our scalps without fighting for em that's what the red verming wants to be at sure as shootin why should the red hand spare our lives i inquired taken by surprise by any offer of life coming from such a quarter has he not just said that all white men are his enemies true but white men may become his friends he wants white men for his allies he has a purpose will the red hand declare his purpose freely his people have taken many fire weapons see they are yonder in the hands of his braves who know not how to use them our enemies the utahs have been taught by the white hunters and the ranks of the arapaho warriors are thinned by their deadly bullets if the pale-faced chief and his three followers will consent to dwell with the band of red hand and teach his warriors the great medicine of the fire weapon their lives shall be spared the red hand will honor the young soldier chief and the white eagle of the forest soldier chief white eagle of the forest how can he have known if you resist continued he interrupting my reflections the red hand will keep his word you have no chance of escape you are but four and the arapaho warriors are numerous as the trees of the big timber if one of them fall by your fire weapons he shall be revenged the red hand repeats what he has said the knives of his braves will hew the living flesh from your bones you shall die a hundred deaths and the great spirit of the arapahoes will smile at the sacrifice be jesus captain cried otig who not understanding spanish was ignorant of what had been said 
that ugly old injun wants a bit of cold lid through him in truth i believe the musket might reach him she belonged to sergeant johnson and was considered the longest rage gun about the fort what if i try her carry on the redskin say the word your honor and here goes so astounded was i at the last words of the arapaho chief that i paid no heed to what the irishman was saying i had turned towards wingrove not for an explanation for the young hunter also ignorant of the language in which the indian spoke was unaware of the illusion that had been made to him i had commenced translating the speech but before three words had escaped my lips the loud bang of a musket drowned every other sound and the cloud of sulphurous smoke covering the whole platform hindered us from seeing one another it needed no explanation the irishman had taken my silence for consent he had fired from the thick of the smoke came his exulting shout hooray he's down be my soul he's down i knew the old musket had reach him hooray the report reverberated from the rocks mingling its echoes with the wild vengeful cries that came pealing up from the plain in an instant the smoke was wafted aside and the painted warriors were once more visible the red hand was erect upon his feet standing by the side of his horse and still holding his spear and his shield the horse was down stretched along the turf and struggling in the throes of death Bigora, captain wasn't it a splendid shot a shot that may cost us our scalps said i for i saw that there was no longer any chance of a pacific arrangement even upon the condition of our making sharpshooters of every redskin in the tribe ha 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 came the wild laugh of the arapaho vengeance on the pale-faced traitors vengeance and shaking his clenched fist above his head the savage chief retired among his warriors end of chapter fifty five recording by john brandon chapter fifty six of the wild huntress this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by shasta oakland california the wild huntress by thomas main reed chapter fifty six attempt to stampede we made an attempt to open the interrupted parley in vain whatever amicable design the red hand might have conceived was now changed to a feeling of the most dreaded hostility there was no more talk to be drawn from him not a word in the midst of his warriors he stood scowling and silent neither did any of the chiefs deign to reply the common braves made answers to our overtures but only by the insult of a particular gesture any hopes we might have conceived of a pacific termination to the encounter died within us as we noted the behavior of the band whether the indian was in earnest in the proposal he had made or whether it was a mere scheme to get our scalps without fighting for them we could not tell it at the time there was an air of probability that he was honest about the matter but on the other hand his notorious character for hostility to the white race contradicted this probability i had heard moreover that this same chief was in the habit of adopting such stratagems to get white men into his power 
we had no time to speculate upon the point nor yet upon that which puzzled us far more how he had arrived at the knowledge of who we were what could he have known of the white eagle of the forest or the young soldier chief so far as i was myself concerned the title might have been explained my uniform i still wore it might have been espied upon the prairies the indians are quick to catch an appellation and communicating it to one another but the figurative sobriquet of the young hunter that was more specific the red hand could not have used it accidentally impossible it bespoke of the knowledge of us and of our affairs that appeared mysterious and inexplicable it did not fail to recall to our memory the apparition that had astonished wingrove in the morning there was no opportunity to discuss the question we had only time for the most vague conjectures before the savages began to fire at us discharging in rapid succession the guns which they had loaded we soon perceived that we had little to fear from this sort of attack unless by some stray bullet there was not much danger of their hitting us their clumsy menage of the fire weapon was evident enough it added to the probability that the chief had been in earnest about giving our instructions to his warriors still was there some degree of danger the guns they had got hold of were large ones most of them old muskets of heavy caliber that cast their ounces of lead to a long distance we heard their bullets pattering against the rocks and one or two of them had passed whistling over our heads it was just possible to get hit and to avoid such an accident we crouched behind our parapet as closely as if we had been screening ourselves from the most expert marksmen for a long time we did not return their fire otig was desirous of trying another shot with his piece but i forbade it warned by what they had witnessed the indians had retired beyond even the range of the sergeant's fusil two parties of savages now separate from the main body and taking opposite directions go sweeping at full gallop round the butte we divine their object they have discovered the position of our animals the intention is to stampede them we perceive the importance of preventing this if we can but keep our animals out of the hands of the savages until darkness come down then may there be some prospect of our escaping by flight true it is only a faint hope there are many contingencies by which the design may be defeated but there are also circumstances to favor it and to yield without a struggle would only be to deliver ourselves into the hands of an unpitying foe the last words uttered by the arapaho chief had warned us that death would be preferable to captivity we are sustained by another remembrance we know that we are not the first white men who have been thus surrounded and who afterwards contrived to escape many a small band of brave trappers have sustained the attack of a whole indian tribe and though half of their number may have fallen the others lived to relate the perilous adventure the life of a determined man is difficult to take a desperate sortie often proves the safest defense and three or four resolute arms will cut a loophole of escape through a host of enemies some such thoughts flitting before us hinder us from succumbing to despair it was of the 
utmost importance to prevent our animals from being swept off and to this end were our energies now directed three of us faced toward them leaving the fourth to do watch from the movements of the enemy on the other side of the butte once more the wild cry rings among the rocks as the red horsemen gallop around rattling their shields and waving their weapons high in the air these demonstrations are made to affright our animals and cause them to break from their fastenings they have not the desired effect the mules prance and hinny the horses neigh and bound over the grass but the long boughs bend without breaking and acting as elastic springs give full play to the affrighted creatures not a rein snaps not a lazo breaks not a loop slides from its hold the first scurry is over and we are gratified to see the four quadrupeds still grouped around the tree as fast as ever to its branches the stampede has proved a failure another swoop of the wild horseman ends with the like result and then another and now closer and closer they come galloping in all directions crossing and meeting and wheeling and circling with shrill screams and violent gesticulations as they pass near they shelter themselves behind the bodies of their horses an arm over the withers a leg above the croup are all of the riders we can see it is useless to fire at these the horses we might tumble over at a pleasure but the men offer no point to aim at at intervals a red face gleams through the tossing locks of the mane but ere we can take sight upon it it is jerked away for a considerable time this play is kept up the indians all the time yelling as if engaged in some terrible conflict as to ourselves we are too wary to waste our shots upon the horses and we reserve them in the hope of being able to draw a bead on some rider more reckless than the rest the opportunity soon offers two of the savages exhibit a determination to succeed in snatching away the horses knife in hand they career around evidently with the design of cutting the bridles and lazos cheered on by the shouts of their comrades they grow less careful of their skins and at length make a dash toward the group under the tree when almost within head reach of the fastenings by which the mules are held one of the latter slews suddenly round and sends her heels in a well-directed fling against the head of the foremost horse the steed instantly wheels and the other coming behind follows the same movement exposing both the riders to our aim they make an effort to throw themselves to the other side of their animals but the opportunity is lost our rifles are too quick for them two of us fire at the same instant and as the smoke clears away the red robbers are seen sprawling on the plain irish shots have proved fatal before we can reload the struggles of the fallen horsemen have ended and both lie motionless upon the grass the lesson was sufficient for the time warned by the fate of their comrades the indians although still continuing their noisy demonstrations now kept well out of the range of our rifles there appeared to be no others in the band desirous of achieving fame at such a risk of life End of chapter fifty six
Chapter Fifty Seven of the Wild Huntress. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Shasta, Oakland, California. The Wild Huntress by Thomas Maine Reed. Chapter Fifty Seven our weak point for some time the savage horsemen continued their circling gallop around the butte one occasionally swooping nearer but covered by the body of his horse in such a way that it was impossible to sight him these maneuvers were executed by the young warriors apparently in a spirit of bravado and with the design of showing off their courage and equestrian skill we disregarded the harmless demonstrations watching them only when they made in the direction of our animals at intervals a hideous face peeping over the withers of a horse offered a tempting target my comrades would have tried a flying shot had i not restrained them a miss would have damaged our prestige in the eyes of the enemy it was of importance that we should continue to believe in the infallibility of the fire weapon after a time we observed a change of tactics the galloping slackened and soon came to an end the horsemen threw themselves into small groups at nearly equal distances apart and formed a ring round the butte most of the riders then dismounted a few only remaining upon their horses and continuing to dash backward and forward from group to group these groups were beyond the range of our rifles though not of the sergeant's musket but the savages both mounted and afoot had taken care to make ramparts of their steeds at first this maneuver of our enemies appeared to have no other object than that of placing themselves in a position to guard against our retreat a moment's reflection however told us that this could not be their design there were but two points by which we could pass down to the plain on opposite sides of the butte why then should they surround us it could not be for the purpose of cutting off our retreat that could be done as effectually without the circular deployment their design soon became apparent we observed that the muskets were distributed among the groups three or four to each with these they now opened fire upon us from all sides at once keeping it up as fast as they could load the pieces the effect was to render our situation a little more perilous not having the means to make our parapet continuous we were at several points exposed had we had good marksmen to deal with we should have been in danger as it was we drew well back towards the centre of the platform and were screened by its outer angles now and then a shot struck a rock sending the splinters in our faces but all four of us escaped being hit by the bullets we had made an observation that rendered us uneasy we had observed a weak point in our defence we wondered that our assailants had not also noticed it around the butte and close up to its base lay many boulders of rock they were prisms of granite that had been detached from the cairn itself and rolled down its declivity they rested upon the plain forming a ring concentric with the circular base of the mound many of these boulders had a diameter of six feet and would have sheltered the body of a man from our shots others again rested along the sloping sides of the butte also of 
prismatic shapes with sides overhanging these might form ramparts for our assailants should they attempt to storm our position even the spreading cedars would have hidden them from our sight they were the trailing juniper of the western wilds very different from the virginian cedar they were of broad bushy forms with stunted stems and tortuous branches densely set with a dark acetalous foliage they covered the sides of the butte from base to middle height with a draping perfectly impenetrable to the eye though there was no path save that already mentioned assailants active as ours might unseen have scaled the declivity should the indians make a bold dash up to the base of the butte leaving their horses and take to the rocks they might advance upon us without risk while working their way up the slope they would be safe from our shots sheltered by the projecting prisms and screened by the trees we should not dare to expose ourselves over the edge of the platform since the others remaining behind the boulders below would cover us with their aim and the shower of arrows would ensure our destruction those who might scale the mound would have us at their mercy assailing us simultaneously from all sides and springing suddenly upon the platform ten to one against us they could soon overpower us these were the observation we had made and the reflections that resulted from them we only wondered that our enemies had not yet perceived the advantage of this plan of attack and since they had neglected it so long we were in hopes that the idea would not occur to them at all it was not long before we perceived our error and that we had miscalculated the cunning of our dusky foes we saw the indians once more taking to their horses some order had reached them from the red hand who stood conspicuous in the midst of the largest group of his warders the movement that resulted from this order was similar to that already practiced in the endeavor to stampede our animals only that all the band took part in it even the chiefs mounting and riding amongst the rest the marksmen alone remained afoot and continued to fire from behind their horses once more the mounted warriors commenced galloping in circles round the butte we perceive that at each wheel they are coming nearer and can divine their intent it is the very plan of attack we have been apprehending we can tell by their gestures that they are about to charge forward to the rocks regardless of the fire from the plain we creep back to the edge of the parapet and point our pieces towards the circling horsemen we are excited with new apprehensions but the caution to keep cool is once more passed around and each resolves not to fire without being certain of his aim on our first shots will depend the success or failure of the attack as before we arrange that two only shall fire at a time if the shots prove true and two of our foes fall to them it may check the charge perhaps repulse it altogether such often happens with an onset of indians on whom the dread of the fire weapon acts with a mysterious effect on the other hand if we miss our fate is sealed and certain we shall not even have the choice of that last desperate resort on which we have built a hope we shall be cut off from all escape for our animals will be gone before we can reach them on foot it would be idle to attempt flight even 
could we run the gauntlet through their line we know they could overtake us upon the plain we feel like men about to throw dice for our lives and dice too that are loaded against us nearer and nearer they come until they are coursing within fifty yards of the butte and scarcely twice that distance from our guns were their bodies uncovered we could reach them but we see only their hands feet and faces the latter only at intervals they draw nearer and nearer till at length they are riding within the circle of danger our superior elevation gives us the advantage we begin to see their bodies over the backs of their horses a little nearer yet and some of these horses will go riderless over the plain ha they have perceived their danger one and all of them notwithstanding their cries of bravado and mutual encouragement they dread to make the final rush each fears that himself may be the victim our heads were growing dizzy with watching them and we were still expecting to see some of them turn their horses and dash inward to the butte when we heard a signal cry circulating through their ranks all at once the foremost of them was seen swerving off followed by the whole troop before we could recover from our surprise they had galloped far beyond the range of our guns and once more stood halted upon the plain End of chapter 57chapter fifty eight of the wild huntress this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by shasta oakland california the wild huntress by thomas main reed chapter fifty eight a rampart on wheels for a time our hearts throbbed more lightly the pressure of apprehension was removed we fancied the savages had either not yet become fully aware of the advantage of storming our position or that the certainty of losing some of their number had intimidated them from making the attempt they had abandoned their design whatever it was and intended waiting for the night the favorite fighting time of the indian this was just what we desired and we were congratulating ourselves that the prospect had changed in our favor our joy was short-lived the enemy showed no signs of repose clustered upon the plain they still kept to their horses by this we knew that some other movement was intended the chiefs were again in the center of the crowd and the red hand conspicuous he was heard haranguing his warriors though we could not guess the purport of his speech his gestures told of fierce rage his glances now and then directed toward us betokened a spirit of implacable vengeance at the conclusion of his speech he waved his hand in the direction of the wagon the gesture appeared to be the accompaniment of a command it was promptly and instantly obeyed a dozen horsemen dashed out from the group and galloped off their course was straight up the valley toward the scene of their late strife those who had remained upon the ground dismounted and were seen giving their horses to the grass this might have led us to anticipate a suspension of hostilities but it did not the attitude of our enemies was not that of 
purposed repose on the contrary they came together afoot and engaged in what appeared to be an eager consultation the chiefs spoke in turn some new scheme was being discussed we watched the party who had ridden off as anticipated the wagon proved to be the butt of their excursion having reached it they halt and dismounting became grouped around it it is impossible for some time to tell what they are doing even the glass does not reveal the nature of their movements there are others beside those who rode out and the white tilt appears in the midst of is dark cluster of men and horses their errand at length becomes obvious the crowd is seen to scatter horses appear harnessed to the tongue and wheels are in motion the vehicle is turned round upon the plain we see that some half dozen horses are hitched on with men seated upon their backs as teamsters they make a wheel and head down the valley in the direction of the butte they are seen urging the animals into a rapid pace the wagon no longer loaded leaps lightly over the smooth sward the horses are spurred into a gallop and amidst the shouts of the savage drivers drag the huge vehicle after them with the rough rapidity of a mountain howitzer in a few minutes it advances to the ground occupied by the dismounted band who surround it upon its arrival we upon the summit have a full view of all we recognize the well-known troy wagon with its red wheels blue body and ample canvas roof the lettering troy new york is legible on the tilt a strange sight in the midst of its present possessors what can their object be with the wagon their actions leave us not long in doubt the horses are unharnessed and led aside half a dozen savages are seen crouching under the axles and laying hold of the spokes as many more stand behind screened from our sight by the tilt cloth the body and boxing the pole projects in the direction of the mound their object is now too painfully apparent without thinking of the analogy of the trojan horse we see that this monster of a modern troy is about to be employed for a similar purpose yes shielded by the thick planking of its bed by its head and hind boards by its canvas covering and other cloths which they have cunningly spread along its sides the savages may approach the mound in perfect safety such is their design with dismay we perceive it we can do naught either to retard or hinder its execution those under the vehicle can spoke the wheels forward without in the least exposing their bodies to our aim even their hands and arms are not visible buffalo robes and blankets hang over draping the wheels from our view those behind are equally well screened and can propel the huge machine without risk of danger we note all these circumstances with feelings of keen apprehension we adopt no means to hinder the movement we can think of none since none is possible we are paralyzed by the sense of our utter helplessness we are allowed but little time to reflect upon it amidst the shouts of the savages 
we hear the creaking of the wheels we behold the mass in motion onward it comes toward the mound advancing with apparently spontaneous motion as if it were some living monster some horrid mammoth approaching to destroy and devour us had it been such a monster its proximity could scarce have inspired us with greater dread we felt that our destruction was equally certain the savages would now surround us advance up the rocks spring upon us from all sides at once and although we might fight to the death which we had determined to do still we must die the knowledge that we should die fighting and with our arms in our hands that we should fall upon the corpses of our enemies avenging death before parting with life this knowledge was but a feeble ray to support and cheer us though no cowards not one of us we could not look forward to our fate without a feeling of dread the certainty of that fate we could no longer question even the time seemed to be fixed in a few minutes the assailants would be upon us and we should be engaged in the last struggle of our lives without the slightest probability of being able to save them End of chapter 58 Chapter 59 of The Wild Huntress This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Shasta, Oakland, California the wild huntress by thomas main reed chapter fifty nine the assault with the prospect of such fatal issue so proximate as to seem already present no wonder that our hearts were dismayed at the sight of the wagon moving toward us as the inhabitants of the leaguered city behold with fear the advance of the screened catapult or mighty ram so regarded we the approach of that familiar vehicle now a very monster in our eyes we were not permitted to view the spectacle in perfect security as the wagon moved forward those who carried the muskets drew still nearer under cover of their horses and once more played upon us their uncertain but dangerous shower with the bullets hissing above and around us we were forced to lie low only at intervals raising our heads to note the progress of the party proceeding to storm slowly but surely the machine moved on its wheels turning under the impulse of brawny arms and impelled forward by pressure from behind to fire upon it would have been of no avail our bullets would have been thrown away as easily might they have pierced through a stockade of tree trunks oh for a howitzer but one discharge of iron grape to have crashed through those planks of oak and ash to have scattered in death that human machinery that was giving them motion slowly and steadily it moved on stopping only as some large pebble opposed itself to the wheel then on again as the obstacle was surmounted on till the intervening space was passed over and the triumphant cheer of our foemen announced the attainment of their object risking the straggling shots we looked over the wagon had reached the base of the butte its tongue was forced up among the trees 
its body stood side by side with the granite prisms the storming party no longer required it as a shield they would be sufficiently sheltered by the great boulders and to these they now betook themselves passing from one to the other until they had completely surrounded the butte we observed this movement but could not prevent it we saw the indians flitting from rock to rock like red spectres and with the rapidity of lightning flashes in vain we attempted to take aim before a barrel could be brought to bear upon them they were gone out of sight we ourselves galled by the leaden hail were forced to withdraw behind our ramparts a moment of suspense followed we knew not how to act we were puzzled by their movements as well as by the silence in which they were making them did they intend to climb up the butte and openly attack us what else should be their design what other object could they have in surrounding it only about a dozen had approached under cover of the wagon was it likely that so few of them would assail us boldly and openly no beyond a doubt they had some other design ha what means that blue column slowly curling upward it is smoke see another and another a dozen of them from all sides they shoot upward encircling the mound hark to those sounds the swish of burning grass the crackle of kindling sticks they are making fires around us the columns are at first filmy but soon grow thicker and more dense they spread out and join each other they become attracted toward the rocky mass they fall against its sides and wreathing upward wrap its summit in their ramifications the platform is enveloped in the cloud we see the savages upon the plain dimly as if through a crepe those with the guns in their hands still continue to fire the others are dismounting the latter abandon their horses and appear to be advancing on foot their forms through the magnifying mist loom spectral and gigantic they are visible only for a moment the smoke rolls its thick volume around the summit and shrouds them from our sight we no longer see our enemy or the earth the sky is obscured even the rock on which we stand is no longer visible nor one of us to the other throughout all continues the firing from the plain the bullets hurtle around our heads and the clamor of our foemen reaches our ears with fierce thrilling import we hear the crackling of faggots and the spurting hissing noise of many fires but perceive no blaze only the thick smoke rising in continuous waves and every moment growing denser around us we can bear it no longer we are half suffocated any form of death before this is it too late to reach our horses doubtless they are already snatched away no matter we cannot remain where we are in five minutes we must yield to the fearful asphyxia no never let us die as we had determined with arms in our hands voices husky and hoarse make answer in the affirmative we spring to our feet and come together so that we can touch each other we grasp our guns and get ready our knives and pistols we make to the edge of the rock and sliding down 
assure ourselves of the path. We grope our way downward, guided by the granite walls on each side. We go not with caution, but in the very recklessness of a desperate need. We are met by the masses of smoke still rolling upwards. Further down, we feel the hot caloric as we come nearer to the crackling fires. We heed them not, but rush madly forward till we have cleared both the cloud and the flames and stand upon the level plain. It is but escaping from the fires of hell to rush into the midst of its demons. On all sides they surround us with poised spears and brandished clubs. Amidst their wild yells, we scarcely hear the cracking of our guns and pistols, and those who fall to our shots are soon lost to our sight behind the bodies of others who crowd forward to encompass us. For a short while we keep together and fight, back to back, facing our foes, but we are soon separated, and each struggles with a dozen assailants around him. The struggle was not protracted. So far as I was concerned, it ended almost on the instant of my being separated from my comrades. A blow from behind, as of a club striking me upon the skull, deprived me of consciousness, leave me only the one last thought, that it was death. End of chapter 59 Chapter 60 of The Wild Huntress This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Shasta, Oakland, California. The Wild Huntress by Thomas Main Reed. Chapter 60 a captive on a crucifix am i dead surely it was death or an oblivion that equaled it but no i live i am conscious that i live light is falling upon my eyes thought is returning to my soul am i upon earth or is it another world in which i awake it is a bright world with a sky of blue and a sun of gold but are they the sky and sun of the earth both may belong to a future world i can see no earth neither fields nor trees nor rocks nor water naught but the blue canopy and the golden orb where is the earth it should be under and around me but i cannot see it neither around nor beneath can i look only upward and forward only upon the sun and the sky what hinders me from turning is it that i sleep and dream is it the incubus of a horrid nightmare upon me am i like prometheus chained to a rock face upward no not thus i feel that i am standing erect as if nailed against a wall if i am not dreaming i am certainly in an upright attitude i feel my limbs beneath me while my arms appear to be stretched out to their full extent and held as in the grasp of some invisible hand my head too is fixed i can neither turn nor move it a cord traverses across my cheeks. There is something between my teeth. A piece of wood, it appears to be. It gags me and half stifles my breathing. Am I in human hands, or are they fiends who are thus clutching me? Anon my senses grow stronger, but wild fancies still mock me. 
i am yet uncertain if it be life what are those dark objects passing before my eyes they are birds upon the wing large birds of sable plumage i know them they are vultures they are of the earth such could not exist in a region of spirits ah those sounds they are weird enough to be deemed unearthly wild enough to be mistaken for the voices of demons from far beneath they appear to rise as if from the bowels of the earth sinking and swelling in prolonged chorus i know and recognize the voices they are human i know the chaunted measure it is the death song of the indian the sounds are suggestive i am not dreaming i am not dead i am awake and on the earth memory comes to my aid by little and little i begin to realize my situation i remember the siege the smoke the confused conflict all that preceded it but nothing after i thought i had been killed but no i live i am a captive my comrades are they alive not likely better for them if they be not the consciousness of life need be no comfort to me in that wild chant there is breathing a keen spirit of vengeance oh that i had not survived to hear it too surely do i know what will follow that dirge of death it might as well be my own i am in pain my position pains me and the hot sun glaring upon my cheek my arms and limbs smart under the thongs that bind too tightly one crosses my throat and almost chokes me and the stick between my teeth renders breathing difficult there is a pain upon the crown of my head and my skull feels as if scalded oh heavens have they scalped me with the thought i endeavor to raise my hand in vain i cannot budge either hand or arm not a finger can i move and i am forced to remain in horrid doubt as to whether the hair be still upon my head with more than a probability that it is gone but how am i confined and where i am fast bound to something every joint in my body is fixed and immobile as if turned to stone i can feel thongs cutting sharply into my skin and my back and shoulders press against some supporting substance that seems as hard as rock i cannot tell what it is i cannot even see my own person neither breast nor body neither arms nor legs not an inch of my soul the fastening over my face holds it upturned to the sky and my head feels firmly set as if the vertebral column of my neck had been ossified into a solid mass and where am i in this stringent attitude i am conscious that i am a captive and bound a captive to indians to arapahoes memory helps me to this knowledge and furthermore that i should be if i have not been carried elsewhere in the valley of the Huerfano, by the orphan butte ha why should i not be upon the butte on its summit i remember going down to the plain and there being stuck senseless to the earth for all that i might have been brought up again the savages may have borne me back to satisfy some whim they often act in such strange fashion with their vanquished victims i must be on some eminence since i cannot see the earth before me in all likelihood i am on the top of the mound this will account 
for my not having a view of the ground it will also explain the direction in which the voices are reaching me those who utter them are below upon the plain the death song ceases and sounds of other import are borne upward to my ears i hear shouts that appear to be signals words of command in the fierce guttural of the arapaho other sounds seem nearer i distinguish the voices of two men in conversation they are indian voices as i listen they grow more distinct the speakers are approaching me the voices reach me as if rising out of the ground beneath my feet they draw nigher and nigher they are close to where i stand so close that i can feel them breathing upon my body but still i see them not their heads are below the line of my vision i feel a hand knuckles pressing against my throat the cold blade of a knife is laid along my cheek its steel point glistens under my eyes i shudder with a horrid thought i mistake the purpose i hear the weak that announces the cutting of a tight-drawn sword the thong slackens and drops off my cheeks my head is free but the piece of wood between my teeth it remains still gagging me firmly i cannot get rid of that i can now look below and around me i perceive the correctness of my conjecture i am on the butte upon its summit i am close to the edge of the platform and command a full view of the valley below a painted arapaho is standing on each side of me one is a common warrior with naught to distinguish him from his fellows the other is a chief even without the insignia of his rank the tall gaunt form and lupine visage are easily identified they are those of red hand the truculent chieftain of the arapahoes now for the first time do i perceive that i am naked from the waist upward there is not a rag upon me arms breast and body all bare this does not surprise me it is natural that the robbers should have stripped me that they should at least have taken my coat whose yellow buttons are bright gold in the eyes of the indian but i am now to learn that for another and very different purpose they have thus bereft me of my garments now also do i perceive the fashion in which i am confined i am erect upon my feet with arms stretched out to their full fathom my limbs are lashed to an upright post and with the same thong are my arms tied to a transverse beam i am bound upon a cross End of chapter 60 Chapter 61 of The Wild Huntress This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Brandon The Wild Huntress by Thomas Main Reed Chapter 61 The Mysterious Circle in an exulting tone the savage chief broke silence bueno cried he as soon as he saw that my eyes were upon him bueno bueno the pale face still lives the heart of the red hand is glad of it ha <laughs> ha ha give him to drink of the fire water of taos let him be strong fill him with life that death may be all the more bitter to him these orders were delivered to his follower who in obedience to them removed the gag and holding to my lips a calabash filled with taos whiskey poured a quantity of the liquor down my throat the beverage produced the effect which the savage chief appeared to desire scarcely had i swallowed the fiery spirit when my strength 
and senses were restored to their full vigor but only to make me feel more keenly the situation in which i stood to comprehend more acutely the appalling prospect that was before me this was the design in resuscitating me no other purpose had the cruel savage had i entertained any doubt as to the motive his preliminary speech would have enlightened me but it was made still clearer by that which followed dog of a pale face cried he brandishing a long spanish knife before my eyes you shall see how the red hand can revenge himself upon the enemies of his race the slayer of panthers and the white eagle shall die a hundred deaths they have mocked the forest maiden who has followed them from afar her vengeance shall be satisfied and the red hand will have his joy ha 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 uttering a peal of demonic laughter the indian held the point of the knife close to my forehead as if to drive the blade into my eyes it was but a feint to produce terror a spectacle which this monster was said to enjoy when grove was still alive the wretch suwanee must be near carajo again yelled the savage what promised you the red hand to cut the living flesh from your bones but no that would be merciful the arapahoes had contrived a sweeter vengeance one that will appease the spirits of our slain warriors we shall combine sport with the sacrifice of the pale-faced dogs ha <laughs> ha after another fiendish cachination far more horrible to hear than his words of menace the monster continued dog you refuse to instruct the arapaho in the skill of the fire weapon but you shall furnish them with at least one lesson before you die ha <laughs> ha you shall soon experience the pleasant death we have prepared for you ah haste he continued addressing himself to his follower prepare him for the sacrifice our warriors are impatient for the sport the blood of our brothers is calling for vengeance this in white with a red spot in the centre the rest of his body in black these mysterious directions were accompanied by a corresponding gesture with the point of his knife the savage traced a circle upon my breast just as if he had been scribing it on the bark of a tree the scratch was light though here and there it drew blood at the words red spot in the centre as if to make the direction more emphatic he punctured the spot with his knife till the blood flowed freely had he driven the blade to its hilt i could not have flinched i was fixed firmly as the post to which they had bound me i could not speak a word either to question his intent or reply to his menace the gag was still between my teeth and i was necessarily silent it mattered little about my remaining silent had my tongue been free it would have been idle to use it in the wolf's visage there was no one trait of clemency every feature bespoke the obduracy of unrelenting cruelty i knew that he would only have mocked any appeal i might have made it was just as well that i had no opportunity of making it after giving some further directions to his follower and once more repeating his savage menace in the same exalting tone he passed behind me and i lost sight of him but i could tell by the noise that reached me at intervals that he had gone down from the rock and was returning to his warriors upon the plain it was the first time since my face fastenings had been cut loose that i had a thought of looking in that direction during all the while that the red hand stood by me i had been in constant dread of 
instant death or of some equally fearful issue the gleaming blade had never been out of my eyes for two seconds at a time for in the gesticulations that accompanied his speeches the steel had played an important part and i knew not the moment it might please the ferocious savage to put an end to my life now that he was gone and i found a respite from his torturing menace my eyes turned mechanically to the plain i therefore beheld a spectacle that under other circumstances might have filled me with horror not so then the agony of my thoughts was already too keen to be further quickened even the gory skull of one of my comrades who lay scalped upon the sward scarcely added an emotion it was a sight i had anticipated they could not all be alive End of chapter 61 Recording by John Brandon